quite sure which mic is on. Um, I hope you all have gotten a timeline. And if you have not raised your hands so the ushers can get you one, they passed it out a few seconds ago. OK. And if you want to look that over while I talk, um, ushers, we have some people down here who don't have one. Sue, Nancy, do we have some more? No. Oh, you're printing more. OK. OK. They're coming. They're coming. Great. The timeline is an abbreviated timeline of one that I found um, on the National Church website about the ordination of women. And some of it's been condensed a little bit because there were so many dates. But if you really want to look at it, scan the scan in your bulletin. Um, Okay. Right there. Whoa. Whoa. That works. That works. Scaring me. Um, anyway, the one on the website that you can go to on your link has pictures in more detail than this timeline has. But I think that I got really into the timeline, so you know you can blame it on me. I just enjoy those types of things. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Barbara Dawson, and I've been an ordained vocational deacon. Uh, for 39 years. And today, I'm going to share parts of my story as an ordained woman with you. And I think that's still really loud. Are you being blasted? No. It sounds really loud to me. No, it's not okay. loud enough. Not loud enough? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, my story is different than Reverend Christa's for two primary reasons. Number one, um, I have been ordained a lot longer. And number two, I'm a deacon and not a priest. And those two orders in the church face different kinds of issues. But we also face a lot of the same because we are ordained women in the same church. So a lot of the issues that I have had, Krista has had, and vice versa. And in order to get to become a priest, you have to go through the diaconate, at least for a short period of time. And as you can see from your timeline, deacons were allowed before priests, kind of, sort of. Um, and they started in 1855, I believe, if memory serves, around then. And I have to say, I grew up in the Episcopal Church and I never saw one, ever. So there were not a whole lot. And as you can see from the timeline, the women's ordination movement was very long and very convoluted, where things were allowed and then they were not allowed. Deacons were allowed and they were recognized as ordained people. And then the church changed its mind and they were not ordained people. So there was a lot of ins and outs as the church grappled with this amazing idea that women might be able to serve in ministry in some way. And that's kind of the way our church works. It grapples with things, and it ponders things, and it chews them up, and he studies them, and then they go back to convention, and they do this and that and the other thing. So this is not an unusual process, although it did take a lot longer than most, from 1855. Let me start by sharing what the Episcopal Church was like for me growing up. I'm at a cradle Episcopalian, some of you are also. For those of you who are not, that means that your family was Episcopalian when you were born and you were brought up in the church. When I was a child, children could not participate in the Eucharist or the communion service. 
They couldn't do that until they were confirmed, usually around age 12 or so. It was kind of a rite of passage. Until then, children went to Sunday school, somewhere away from the adults. In my church, we were in the basement because I lived in Nebraska and they had basements, but they were not with the adults at all. If you were a boy, and you were 12-ish, and the priest thought you might be able to behave for a while, you might be able to be an acolyte, but girls could not. Boys got to be up in the big church, hear the music, see the liturgy, carry the cross and the cool candles, and I was stuck in Sunday school. Men served on the vestry, Women took care of the church by participating in the ECW, Episcopal Church Women. Anybody here ever in the ECW? Okay. Or one of the many women's guilds that the church had, and different guilds handled different kinds of things in the church. The only one that is really around right now, to my knowledge, and some of you who are active in ECW, which does still exist, can correct me, um, is the altar guild, who takes care of making sure that we're all set up for church services, that we have everything we need and everything is ready, and then they clean up afterwards. It's really, really an important ministry. So the men ran everything. The men were on the vestry. The men made all the decisions. The men were in all the leadership positions. But women actually did the work of the church. And we would have been lost without them. We would not have had a church without the women. In my teens, I got really, really excited about Tudor history and Reformation history, uh, which is the time when the church broke away from the Roman church and many denominations were formed, the Lutherans, us, Presbyterian, a whole bunch. And... I spent a lot of time talking about what made my church different. I was really proud of it, and I thought it was super cool. I still do. But I talked with my Catholic friends a lot because I lived in a pretty Catholic area, and we had commonality in the conversation. They had similar liturgy, similar structure, all that kind of stuff. And I want you to know that we have the coolest origin story of any church. The Lutherans have a big theological thing. Okay, we'll grant them that. But we have Henry VIII. (laughs) What better origin story could there be? There's sex, there's love, there's a temper tantrum that Henry had that told the Pope to go stick it. There's just everything that you could possibly imagine. Who can beat that? I gave passing thought about one day going to seminary to study church history, but then I thought, you know, what would that do? What job could I get? What what would happen after that? I don't want to be a priest. That's not anything I have ever wanted to do. I didn't want to be a priest, even if I could have been a priest. So that idea went out the window. I got married, finished college, worked for a while, had a child, and in 1980, my husband David was transferred to Salt Lake City, Utah, where our daughter Jennifer was born. And I cried all the way there. We lived in LA and we went to Salt Lake City, Utah. I was convinced I was going to the land that time forgot. And while there was still some truth to that, um, I did not know that I was going to the land where creative ministry was running rampant. In Salt Lake, my interest in what makes denominations different resurged, except that the conversation stopped being around Protestants mainstream Protestants, and was between the Episcopalians and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the LDS or the Mormons. And we spent a lot of time talking about what we believed and what the Mormons believed, 
and the Mormons talked about what they believed and what we believed. And it was really pretty much the primary topic of conversation any place you went. David and I got really involved in our local church, which provided both our spiritual life and our social life. And when we got there, there were two rectors in our little church. There were 11 Episcopal churches in the Diocese of Utah, which was the entire state plus parts of Navajo land. So most of the churches were little. Ours was actually a big one compared to some where people actually met in basements of, of parishioners' homes. They didn't even have a building. They may, met in the basement. So when we got there and there were two priests, we looked at each other and said, wow, it was a married couple, a man and a woman, and it was awesome. We, I had never seen a woman priest. I'd never seen a woman function in the church like a priest, doing anything. It was incredible. We were so excited. What we did not realize at the time was that they were a twofer. Bogo. Buy one, get one free. The two of them functioned, and the woman could function because the bishop led her. But they were paid one salary. So you could say one of them wasn't paid, or you could say they each worked for half pay. But there were not two people getting paid the correct amount. And unfortunately, that woman came under such stress that her marriage broke up and she left the diocese after trying to commit suicide. And a couple months after that, um, the Bishop of Utah decided that more clergy were needed in the diocese to do a lot of things, and so he called, wanted to call deacons in to do a lot of the um, servant types of ministry, which the diaconate is a servant order. That's what we do. And as you know, there are three orders of ministry, ordained ministry. There are really four orders of ministry. The biggest and the most powerful are the laity. Then you have ordained ministry, deacons, priests, and bishops. Um, our, de our bishop in Utah called each parish to bring forth names of people to serve in the diaconate, and my church got all excited about that. And 18 names were brought up. And we were called into a big group and said, okay, your name's been given, and would you like to be a deacon? And everybody said, sure. And they said, well, in order to do that, you have to do blah, 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 blah. And the door could not cope with the people running out of the room right away. So we went from 18 to five, and then one person was transferred, so we ended up being four. And after three years of study and working through the process and trying to figure out what the process was and doing all sorts of crazy things, four of us were ordained to the diaconate on March 14th, 1985. Three men and me. And at that time, I became the youngest ordained person in the Diocese of Utah and the only ordained woman in the Diocese of Utah. And I was the only ordained woman for quite some time. There were people, women, who were in seminary who were studying towards the priesthood, but they had not yet been ordained anything. So it was me. Um, I do need to share that the male clergy of the diocese were not excited about deacons. They, um, they were concerned that we would take over their jobs because we didn't get paid. We do not get paid. And the bishop said, oh, don't worry, no problem. They won't preach, and you know they're not going to consecrate sacraments, so they'll just do pastoral care and stuff like that. And the, the priest grudgingly said, okay. And I said, yay, we're not going to preach because I don't ever want to preach. I was so excited. But the, the um, Bishop of California had different ideas. 
when he was setting up deacons and said deacons will preach. So the deacons who are here do, except me. Um, they also had a fit over deacons wearing clerical collars. They were very protective of their jobs. This is their livelihood. And they thought that wearing a clerical collar indicated that you were a priest. And the four deacons said, no, no, no. You have a clerical collar. That means you have been ordained. And the Bishop of Utah said, we were correct. And so we got to wear our collars when we served. We didn't wear our collars just around. We wore them when we served. You will also know that all of us, or most of us, worked in the secular world, unless we were retired when we became a deacon. So we certainly didn't wear our collars or anything like that to work. Although I kept mine in my car because I would often go to do a funeral or visit somebody or do something like that um, on my lunch hour or after work. Another thing that was a problem early on, besides the clerical collars, was clergy shirts. When I was first ordained, nobody made women's clergy clothes. And I had to buy a man's shirt, which in order to get it buttoned, was so big that the tail went below my knees. And I don't sew, so I struggled and struggled to cut the bottom, it was almost half the shirt, to cut it off so that I could actually wear it, you know, tuck it in someplace, put a skirt, something with it. And I was so excited when women's clerical clothes came out, and now there's quite a few. We could still use more, but there's quite a, quite a few options, which are great. The people I knew when I was first ordained were really excited to have a woman. And I became kind of like a puppy, where you pull her out and say, oh, look what we have. Isn't she cute? You know, it's great. So cool. And I was real excited, and I said, yeah, pull me out. And they would ask me to do things, go to their club meetings, or go out and visit their family. This was particularly, interestingly enough, something that happened in my workplace for people who were not part of my congregation, but they were mad at their church or didn't have a church, and suddenly they had me. And I became a pastor every place I worked to the people in my workplace. But one of my parishioners asked me to go give the invocation at a board of realtors meeting in Salt Lake City, and some of you have heard this story. Um, and I said, sure, I'll do that. And I made arrangements at work to take a long lunch hour, and I went. And I should have known when she said it was at the convention center, which was huge, sort of like going to the Cow Palace or something like that, that it was a bigger deal than what I thought. I thought it would be like a PTA meeting. No, no, no. We walk in, and I was in the biggest um, meeting room I'd ever seen with the biggest head table I have ever seen, ever. It looked like the United Nations. It filled up windows in a big U, and they had at least places for 30 people, if not more. And I wandered around trying to find my spot, and I found my little name tag, and I was almost at the end of one of the legs. I was the next to the last seat. So I'm here, and there's another seat here. And I sit down, and I wait. Other people start coming in, and. They're milling around, finding their place. They sit down. And the man who was assigned the seat next to me finally showed up, and he took one look at me, didn't say a word. And he took his chair, and he turned it this way. And he sat down, and we're on a podium. It's raised. There wasn't a lot of room, and he's right against a wall. And he sat down, swished his body in there, and sat there the whole time. He didn't speak to me. I don't know why he was there. I don't, know, I don't remember what his function was. But he sat there, and he ate his meal like this. And I sat there. The person on the other side just didn't talk to me. I gave my invocation. I ate my food, waited till the program was done, and it was over, and it was OK to leave. I left, got in the car, and just started laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing. I still think it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. This man stuck looking at the wall because he wasn't going to acknowledge the fact that I existed. I was not invited back. 
Another thing that was prevalent during the early days of ordination was, um, became very apparent at conventions, and some of you who were convention delegates at that time may remember. Um, our church did not embrace the ordination of women all at one time. Diocese had the option of saying yes or no within their diocese. The Diocese of Utah said yes, Diocese of California said yes, Diocese of San Joaquin, which is our neighbor, said no, um, other dioceses said no. And people who are in the ordination process have to be sponsored by both a parish and a diocese. So women who were sponsored by parishes within the diocese where women were not accepted, roamed from diocese to diocese where it was okay to try and get those bishops to sponsor them. And the Diocese of Utah was one. And sometimes there were more women there looking for sponsorship than there were delegates to convention. Get 40 or 50 of them every convention. And that went on for six, seven years or so until enough of the diocese had accepted the ordination of women that people could get in uh, fairly well. But that was kind of a fun time. It made a lot of different people struggling to get into the process. When I moved here, David was transferred in 1987, and I became the deacon at Church of the Resurrection up the street. I was told that there may be men who would not take communion from me, and there were. That was not something I had in Utah because they, you know, they thought I was cool. I was the puppy. But these guys were not sure about the ordination of women and wanted to make a point of it. So they didn't ever say anything. But when I would be doing communion, we had a communion rail, and I would come up to them to give them the bread, they'd walk away. Or they would leave from where I was and walk around the altar rail to the place where the male priest was giving bread. They couldn't just go there first. They had to come to me and then leave to make their point. So I gradually started talking to them at coffee hour where they were amongst a bunch of other people. And it would have been quite awkward for them to just walk away. Their wives would have scolded them for being rude. And after a few months of doing that, they stopped moving around the altar rail, and were starting to take communion from me. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder why. So I asked one of them, you know, what has changed? Why, why is this okay now? And he said, well, you know, I know you. And you, Barb, are okay. But those other women, I don't know about them. <laughs> and that's how people oftentimes work their way into a congregation that was not jumping up and down to have women. It was not an uncommon thing. One of the things that's been a stumbling block for us all um, since the very beginning, and if you have seen the movie, the uh, Philadelphia 11, it, it came up in that movie, which is one of the reasons why I was thinking about it, was what to call ordained women. Men were father, Father John, Father Bob, Father Smith, whatever. So do we call ordained women mother? What do we do? Mother, father? I always thought I was never a mother supporter. But there are all sorts of things that came up and I can't even remember what they all were. But gradually, at least in my parish, it became we'll just call each other by our first names and forget the title. We know our title. They know our title. We don't need to refer to the title. And that worked for us. Some people, it was important to use the title. And I don't disagree with that. So it became like reverend in the first name, or reverend in the last name. And I think it's interesting that one of the first things that the woman's clericus asked Bishop Austin when we had a clericus meeting here a couple of weeks ago. 
was, what do you, Bishop, want to be called? In our hopes of him saying what he would like to be called, it will reflect on how he would like us to be called. And he said, you can call me Austin when we're in an informal setting, and call me Bishop Austin in a more formal setting, and I will do the same with you. So that seems pretty egalitarian. And I hope that over time that conversation will end because it's been going on for 50 years. We should be able to solve that. Um, our cultural experience with women clergy is also really funny. And if you want to have a good time and get a good laugh, ask Chris, Reverend Krista or me to go to the store with you right after church with our collars on. Um, I went to Target after church one day, and it was really crowded because of the farmer's market. And I walked in, and people were almost falling all over themselves to stare at me and to poke at other people. Hey, did you see the lady over there? Look, what is she? What is she doing? And somebody else is going, it's really hot. Why is she wearing a turtleneck? <laughs> and somebody else is thinking, I didn't know it was Halloween already. As a culture, we don't know what to do with women clergy. It's not just in our church. So as that expands and there's more and more experience with that, we'll come around. But there aren't that many of us, and it's something many people still have not encountered. So we still have a long ways to go. There's so much to talk about the ordination of women and the issues that we've had, and the good times and the bad times that we've had, that we just can't do it in a setting like this. But Reverend Kristen and I are happy to talk about it with you at any time. And I wanna just share a little bit about what women clergy are thinking and dealing with now. Um, we're looking at ways to get women clergy in more leadership positions in the church. Pay and job position equity. Paid family leave benefits, which the church does not yet have. And the ability of deacons to participate in the church pension fund, which means that a deacon serving in a church, we're not paid but in order to participate in the pension fund and be able to have church benefits of some sort, the churches need to pay us a budget-breaking $25 a month. So we're working to get that. So what am I doing now? Um, after 32 years of being the deacon at Church of the Resurrection, I'm taking a break from regular parish ministry. And I'm very, very thankful to Reverend Krista for allowing me to serve as deacon on occasion. It's a lot of fun for me and helps me to remember what I'm supposed to do. Um, but I am really quite busy working on things to support the diaconate. And I am currently the president of the School for Deacons Board of Directors, uh, the chair of the Council of Deacons, and somehow managed to become the convener of the Women's Clericus. But I really hope that by having me serve or someone else serve in a diaconal position, it will carry out the strong legacy of the diaconate that St. Paul's has, thanks to Donna Dolphson, Margaret Mary Stoller, and the other deacons that you've had throughout times. Because we work in conjunction with the priests and the bishop, and also the laity. So it's a very unusual type of thing where we're in both, both camps. So thank you very much. I am delighted to have been able to have been ordained, but I could not have been if those Philadelphia 11 women did not take the daring step to push the envelope and go against the church law and face the repercussions that they had 
and the anger and animosity that they faced so that we could be here today. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for your story. Um, just so you get a, a concept or a, a picture of it, I was born in 1975. So I grew up in a world where the church has always had women priests. As a matter of fact, I didn't understand this until much later. I actually went to church with my best friend because, you know, if you spend the night at someone's house, you have to go to church the next day. That's the kind of household she ran. Um, at a little Episcopal church in North Carolina called St. Anne's. And St. Anne's was created in 1965 to create integrated worship. They wanted a space where it didn't matter what color you were, you could worship together. And I grew up in that parish, kind of, on the side, and they had fold-out chairs, and it was one building, and I thought that that was the norm of the Episcopal Church, just so you know. Uh, um, and as I grew into high school and I returned to this church, they had a woman rector. I didn't think twice about it. But I looked up later that she was the very first ordained rector in the Diocese of North Carolina, so the first woman to be in charge of a, of a congregation in the Diocese of North Carolina, the Reverend Virginia Herring, and I give thanks for that. So in my transaction, transactional, uh, transitional diaconate, we only had women. There were three of us. So when I came to California to do ministry, Imagine my surprise that this church didn't have women at every corner of leadership. Imagine my surprise that there was pushback about women being leaders. California has a thing. This is kind of our, this is our, this is our thing that we need to work on. We love to say and be and say and be forefront of all these different aspects of the church and the world and to be first in that. But the integration is really, really hard. And I bet you might have experienced that in your lives, integrating and breaking boundaries in the land where breaking boundaries is kind of the thing, that it's hard to integrate. So I just wanted to say our work is not done. When the Me Too movement, I realized that what I thought was kind of annoying, we actually had names for, like um, gaslighting, right? That was one of those terms. And that the line that I thought was there was actually way over here. And my younger women after me were like not putting up with any of this. And I give thanks for that. We have so much more work to do. What is how to be a priest, male or female? I believe that's where we really need to do some more work. That this binary understanding of what is male or what is female and what it means to be a priest might be so much bigger than where we are. That God's love is expansive. And that's what was happening with Jesus on the hill, looking at that impossible task, saying, how are we possibly going to feed all these people? God's love feeds everything and everyone. We get caught up on exactly how, right? But we forget that God's love is so much bigger and so much wider and more creative than we are. We just need to keep opening ourselves up to it. So I wanted to end with a little Mary Oliver poem. Why worry about the loaves and fishes? If you say the right words, the wine expands. If you say them with love. And the ferocity, felt that ferocity of that love and felt the necessity of that love, the fish will explode into many Imagine him speaking, and don't worry about what, the rea what is reality, or what is plain, or what is mysterious. If you were there, it was all those things. If you can imagine it, it was all those things. Eat, drink, and be happy. Accept the miracle. Accept, too, each spoken word, spoken with love. As Michael Curry says, if it isn't about love, it's not about God. Amen.